begin tonight with breaking news out of Indiana. A young mother, down on her luck, decides to leave family and friends. She finds refuge through a local church, moving into a shelter with her 10-year-old daughter. But when the mother's family reports them missing, you're not going to believe this. It is also revealed she has a three-year-old son. Okay, but the family says they haven't seen the little boy for nearly a year. Why? Because he's dead. So why didn't somebody call police sooner? Maybe because investigators have just uncovered the remains of a small child in a tote bag hidden in a closet. The remains believed to be the missing three-year-old boy. Why? The mother tells police she couldn't take the toddler's temper tantrums, force-feeding him olive oil and vinegar until he stopped breathing. So why do autopsy results released late today show his larynx was crushed? It started out with just a phone call, and it just completely unraveled into what we now are looking into as a child death investigation. That phone call to police was from a concerned friend. They hadn't been able to contact mom. Someone who had not seen 31-year-old Letitia Lawson. They hadn't been able to determine the welfare of these two children. Her 10-year-old daughter. Her 10-year-old daughter was Or three-year-old son. But her son was not. During questioning, Lawson told police, quote, her son was with God. According to court documents, Lawson said she couldn't take her son's tantrums. Gave him olive oil and vinegar until he stopped breathing. She wrapped his remains in a blanket and she placed that body in a closet. During questioning, police asked Lawson if she knew at the time she had murdered her son. She answered, yes. Good evening, I'm Jean Casares of In Session on the True TV Network in for Nancy Grace. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. A three-year-old Indiana boy missing for months when police finally tracked down the mother there. Hidden in a closet, the remains of a small child. For the latest, let us go straight out to Elizabeth Fields, reporter with CNN affiliate WANE. Elizabeth, what is the latest tonight? Well, Jean, like you said, we did get the autopsy results back today saying that this little boy died of asphyxiation with compression on his neck. He was found in a Fort Wayne home earlier this week. And police say that they have every reason to believe that his mother is the one that killed him. Like I said, it started Monday night even more bizarrely when police said that they had a whole missing family that they were looking for. A 31-year-old mother, her 10-year-old daughter, and 3-year-old son. Family members said that they hadn't seen them since September, maybe October, and they hadn't seen this little boy since before that. Later that night, the mother and the daughter were found, and they were found safe and sound, but that little boy was nowhere to be seen. During questioning, police asked her where that little boy was. She told them that he was with God, and she told them it was because she couldn't take his temper tantrums, that she gave him olive oil and vinegar until he stopped breathing, and that she did all of this in November of 2009. So now she is in jail, and she is facing child neglect charges until DNA results can confirm that this little boy's body is, in fact, her son's. to Mike Wilson, reporter and anchor of WOWO News Talk 1190 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Who exactly went to police on Monday saying this family was missing? Well, as it turned out, it actually was a, a local pastor who had put them up in a house on Wabash, and that local pastor went to police and said, look, this is what we found. We've got uh, a woman that's here. You're looking for her, and was able to help at that point to, uh, to locate just the woman and, of course, her daughter, who were found safely at that home on Wabash. Well, Elizabeth Fields, reporter of CNN affiliate WANE, isn't it true that uh, Monday night on local television, your station, you publicized this missing family for anyone that had any information? Yeah, exactly. At that time, police told us that they believed all three of them could be in some sort of danger, but they put a special emphasis on that little boy. They said that they really believed at that point that some sort of foul play had come into play. 
and that at the very best he was in immediate danger. Now, but all three were, were unaccounted for. Elizabeth, set me straight here. Where does this roommate, there is a roommate, a former roommate of this mother. Where does she play into this? Did she go to police too? We believe so. We believe that she went on a, on a separate account at a different time. Family members reported them missing, but she had come forward um, to, to tell them what she had known um, about a possible body in there. Um, the reverend or the pastor that we had mentioned, he said that he had no idea that there was a roommate even there. All right. Desher McCollum, crime analyst, director of the Cold Case Squad, Pine Lake PD. All right, here you go. You've got a crime scene investigation that is spanning a year. This mother says, I fed him alcohol, I fed him olive oil and vinegar because I couldn't take his tantrums. But yet his larynx is crushed. Where do you start this crime scene investigation? Is it at the original home that the roommate says is the location of the homicide? Well, you're certainly going to start where the body was found, but then you've got to work backwards. I mean, you're not talking about a primary crime scene. If you're talking about 10 months and she's been transient the whole time, you don't know where the primary crime scene may be. So you're going to go to every location we know that she's lived. The problem, too, Jean, you know, vinegar doesn't crush a larynx. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Inconsistency. You're exactly right. Mike Wilson, reporter, anchor, WOWO, talk, 1190 AM. Do we know how many locations that this woman carried this dead little three-year-old in a tote bag throughout the course of the year? Uh, no, throughout the course of the year we don't, and, and police haven't uh, released that information yet, and they're probably still finding out at this point because apparently she was uh, relatively transient in nature with this local pastor helping her out to put her up in that house in Wabash. Uh, she also showed up to that church to try and find some help as well, uh, obviously with the winter weather getting colder and she was starting to move around. So we're, we're, still, uh, we're still looking into that and, and trying to find out exactly how many locations there were and, and which locations uh, they might have been at and if she actually had the body at one location that stayed there or she moved that around with her as well. To Elizabeth Field, CNN affiliate WANE, we want to tell everybody we're taking your calls live tonight, but Elizabeth, I have one question. If she originally put the body in a blanket and put it in a closet of one place that she was living. Do we know when she switched that to the tote bag? We don't know that exactly for sure. Um, and again, the, the pastor told us that when she showed up with him, she didn't have any bags that would have been large enough for her to, cons to, to hide a body in. So we're not exactly sure when that happened either. And how old is her living daughter, Kiera? 10 years old? That's correct. All right. Let's go out to the caller, Sherry, in New York. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Thank you for your call. Your question. Yes. Where is where is the mother and the father's um, family throughout this time? Didn't they notice the child was missing or the children were missing? Well, well, that's a really, really good question. To Elizabeth Fields, the family came forward, but what about for the last year? Why didn't they talk about this missing little boy? Police gave me the impression that it may not have been that they just haven't seen them or that they hadn't had any contact at all, but that the family and the mother was being more evasive than anything. So, again, the contact was pretty little, but they, they were here in Fort Wayne. Well, let's go to the lawyers, to Kelly Sangden, family law attorney tonight out of Chicago, Illinois, Daniel Horowitz, defense lawyer out of San Francisco, and Alan Ripka, defense attorney out of New York, to Kelly Sangden. What we understand is that she told the pastor's wife, I had a second child, but I gave him up for adoption. This little 10-year-old girl that is now in the hands of Child Protective Services, in my opinion, she's lucky to be alive tonight. I absolutely agree with you, and I feel so horrible for that girl because we don't know what she went through. We don't know what she saw. It's very possible she's going to be called to be a witness in a case against her mother for the murder of her younger brother. Yes, very, very true. Ten-year-olds can be witnesses. To Daniel Horowitz, defense lawyer, before you say that she has mental issues, I'm going to say she was pretty <laughs> smart. You know, Daniel, because normally people take a body and they put it in a dumpster, they put it in a field or a, a long ways away where no one can find it. She kept it with her. Who's going to find it if you keep it with you?
Yeah, but Jean, she's not trying to get away with this crime. I mean, she tells the police that she killed this child in a, a crazy, horrific way with olive oil and vinegar. That makes no sense. That's inflammatory. I think she'll be found to be schizophrenic, severely mentally ill. It's a tragedy, but it's really a tragedy that we didn't find out about her problem and help her before we lost this little child. Well, Ellen Ripka, she said to investigators, you know what? I couldn't take the temper tantrums anymore. So I killed my child. That sounds like someone that knew right from wrong and just didn't want to be bothered. Well, you know, it's certainly an admission that could be used against her in a court of law. What I say is she may not have been the one who actually killed the child. When you admit something, you come up with another excuse. I gave the, the baby oil and vinegar, but the, the baby had a broken neck. But why tell them something that they know that she knows they're going to find out isn't true? They may have been help here, a boyfriend, a friend, or something else that she's not talking about. All right, but the fact is there is an inconsistency right off the bat. And was this even a true confession? Because the medical autopsy reports that just came out late this afternoon show otherwise. Let's go to Marla in West Virginia. Hi, Marla. Hi. Um, I actually have three quick questions. Uh, one, how would the oil and vinegar actually kill an infant? Two, where were any support system? And three, could does a safe haven law not apply to that child where she could drop a child off at a, a fire department, hospital, et cetera? All right, good question. First, let's go to Kelly Sandon, family law attorney out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the safe haven mall, uh, could that have been an option here? Certainly. And in this woman, especially with the case of the pastor helping her, if she couldn't handle this three-year-old, she could have absolutely reached out for help. And certainly she could have left him and been protected and not gone so far as to murder her son. She could have just the child to the pastor. Police have arrested an Indiana mother of two after she allegedly admitted to killing her three-year-old son with olive oil and vinegar because she couldn't take his temper tantrums.